This is the Dallas Prospect Live with DDP. Every legend was once a prospect. The Dallas Prospect is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash the Dallas Prospect or become a member by clicking the join button. Now let the show begin. What's up, guys? This is Derek Kirby again for the Dallas Prospect. And we're getting a little bit later, obviously, into the post-game show from Game 5. Last night was a brutal game. It didn't help that I had an 8 a.m. class that I had to be ready for. And despite it being a blowout, there were a bajillion technical fouls and fouls in general. Felt like the game dragged on forever and what was decidedly already over. So I just decided, you know what? My sleep's a little more important. I'll roll into it today. So here we are, and for a 43-point game, there sure is plenty to talk about. Now, for this game, it's worth noting the Mavericks actually did come out clicking pretty much on all cylinders. They were immediately up seven points. They made four of their first six threes, I want to say. Tim Hardaway Jr. got off to a hot start, and you started to kind of think, you know, Maybe they are up for the challenge again. Obviously, we found out about an hour or so before tip-off that KP was again not going to be available for this game. I actually have another segment I'm going to do on that. I'm going to try to get about three uploads for you guys today if I can. But uh, yeah, let's just focus on the game here for this one. So no KP. Mavericks still start hot. But oh man, when the Clippers turned it on and started coming after Dallas... They poured it on like no doubt the Clippers were down seven and then they just shifted gears basically into the the caliber of team many people have been saying that they were since they acquired Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and ran roughshod essentially at that point. They were very physical. Yes, it was Kane Fitzgerald again, the head official. That's the same official that ejected KP bogusly in many's opinion uh, in game one. He again, I think, I, I, say what you want about the inconsistency of foul calls, how on one end Kawhi Leonard can get away with four offensive fouls in one play before getting rewarded for an and one, while on the other end Luka and other Mavericks can get pummeled with no call. Say what you want about that. The, the way that he does not manage a game is a problem. This game was very physical, very chippy. The Clippers bench basically decided that they were going to turn up the obnoxious factor to 20-fold because they're up 30 at times in this game, and they're still screaming about every, every call against them, everything that they disagree with. They're still talking trash that, to the point where it's drawing the Mavericks bench offsides, and you got them chirping. You got timeouts where Patrick Beverly's running past Boban uh, shouting something as well. And it's like, dude, you're not even in this game. You're not even dressed out for the game. Why are you on the court? All kinds of things like that. The, they did not manage it well. And then you started to see things get super chippy. You started to see a lot of, frankly, dangerous plays. Marcus Morris, again, we're going to get into that. That's going to be another segment as well, but I will kind of touch on it here a little bit. Marcus Morris makes not one, but two extremely dangerous Attempts basically at injuring Luka, and I don't give a crap what he says after the fact, denying it. This guy has a history, and these are not these are not innocent plays. Everyone who's trying to say this is incidental is ignoring that he changes the pace of his of his gait and direction completely. And if you if you misstep on something, you pull back. Like if I'm walking through the house and I step on something that I didn't know was there and it's unintentional, I pull back. I damn sure don't follow through with my full weight to the point where it steps, where it takes off Luca's shoe because I stepped on the back of his ankle, his injured ankle, no less. And then he takes another shot later on trying to Zaza Pachulia him, which is ironic because Kawhi Leonard is his teammate, but just attempts at injuring, you know, a, a young up and coming star in this league and obviously the Mavericks won basically one major hope for this series you can point to the role players and all that but with no KP it's basically like Luka has to go out there and play out of his mind so you had incidents like that you had a flagrant foul that Tim Hardaway Jr. gets later when he takes a very hard swipe at Paul George 
full windup. And uh, yes, he does initially get a lot of ball, but he does follow through the rest of the way and get George across the face and jaw. George takes exception to that, but Zubats pulls him back in and basically prevents it from being any kind of scuffle. I just didn't feel like the officials did a good job managing this game. They let it get out of control. They let tensions start to really boil over. There were six technicals issued in this game. Like, out of control. Rick Carlisle got ejected um, because there comes a moment later on. Again, the Clippers are up like 30 when this happens. There is an and one in transition called when I think it's Tim Hardaway Jr. gets a bucket in transition. They call a foul on Paul George. It's a ticky-tack foul, but they called it. And then as the ball is being passed to the free throw shooter, uh, Doc Rivers calls for a review. The rest blow the play dead. Go review it. Carlisle loses his mind at this point because if you have the ball, they can't review it. The window of opportunity has elapsed. Now, it's in the process of the ball being passed, and so ends up they probably were right giving them the call, but the refs don't explain it. So when Carlisle protest this um Fitzgerald basically immediately warns him to stand down Carlisle persists gives him a technical to which Carlisle sarcastically claps in his face immediately gets a second technical and ejected from the game now to be fair with the way this game was going at that point I can't say I blame Carlisle for wanting to get out of there a little bit early but yeah there's there's a lot going on here in this game where it's just out of control Montrez Harrell is all kinds of obnoxious, screaming all the time, um, getting kind of in guys' faces. He had a great game, 19 and 11, but obnoxious factor through the roof. And every time anyone on the Clippers did anything, the whole bench is hooping and hollering. As if, you know, they're the two seed, the team that's been largely crowned as the eventual champion, or at least in the Western Conference Finals at bare minimum, for like 13 months now. And yet they're not acting as if they're tied two to two in a game in a series against a shorthanded seven seed. Kind of interesting how they ignore that context, but I digress. Uh, this this series just very very frustrating. This is the first game where it did not just swing. Uh, it did not swing back for Dallas to make any kind of run. Yes, there was no Patrick Beverly, as I said earlier, and that was an advantage for Dallas, but not having KP and possibly not having him again for the rest of the series certainly hurts Dallas's chances. Luka did not look quite right in this series or in this game, which I actually anticipated. I actually talked about that in the on the Instagram channel, the ride along um, Instagram channel on my Instagram, Kirby Create underscore DDP. I actually, in my preview of the game a couple hours before tip off, mention that that you know Luca would have to basically put forth a Herculean effort without KP the problem is he played 45 minutes and gave every ounce of everything he had and it took a historic performance on one ankle just to get that last win so to ask him to do it again about 48 hours later is incredibly difficult less than 40 oh yeah 48 hours since that game uh incredibly difficult to ask for so you know it works out where uh, he's not quite right. He has like nine points at the half. They do throw a lot of Paul George and Kawhi at him, which again, I said they probably would do. Although they also threw Kawhi at Trey Burke at times, which I thought was interesting. Really showed how they wanted to neutralize Dallas's secondary um, ball handler and creator, the guy who's been the biggest X factor, I would say, for Dallas in this series. Um, and then... Marcus Morris, again, cross pass with Luka, but they threw a lot at Luka, and we talked about this. It's the one team that should have the ability to junk things up for Dallas and to do this. They did, and this was the first game where it really looked like Dallas just had no answer. Now, you could look at this series thus far a couple different ways. You could look at it and say, you know what? Dallas could easily be up 3-1 if not for KP's ejection going into this game, to be clear. Dallas could have been up 3-1 going into this game, uh, if not for KP's Game 1 ejection. It was really only Game 3 where the Clippers just thoroughly outplayed uh, Dallas. That was the Luka injury. And even then, Dallas's bench made a very respectable run, cut it to like 8 points in the fourth quarter. Great. KP was great in that game as well. That, unfortunately, was basically the end of what we saw from KP. He takes a spill there on the last inbounds pass, and now suddenly we're hearing about a knee. I don't know if there's any correlation there, but that was the last play of Game 3 
uh, when that happened. So you could make that argument, but you could also look at it and say, you know, other than game two where Dallas led wire to wire, they've had games where they've trailed by 18, by 21, and by 24. Now, obviously, in this game, it blossomed all the way into 43 points. But you look at it and you're like, well, you can make the argument that Dallas has outplayed them largely in three games. The Clippers have shown when they dial in and when they're focused, they've just got more in the tank. Even with, you know, Pandemic Paul, who finally woke up, he'd played like trash the last three games. And with a minimum of 10 shot attempts per game over the last three games coming into yesterday, Paul George was shooting less than 25% in each of those games. First time that's happened since Bob Cousy as far as a playoff series. Um, he was wretched, and he finally woke up yesterday. 35 points, 12 of 18 from the field, including 4 of 8 from 3. They got him going. Doc Rivers basically told him going into the game, hey, I want you to go out there and take 25 shots. Now, obviously, he takes 18. It's not near close enough game for him to need to take more than that. But that trust allowed George to shoot his way out of it. He scored more points last night alone than he had in the three previous games combined. By the way, on the poll, uh, the poll I did the other day, it was PG-13% that won, uh, won the nickname battle for him. But considering he's definitely shooting better than 13% now, we might just stick with Pandemic Paul and uh, hope that that can level out possibly. But yeah, George much better yesterday. Still annoying, still annoying. And I'm sure I haven't looked at his social media or anything today, but I'm sure he's more than happy to make it so people can see his comment or yeah, comment on his posts again because now, oh, now he proved himself. So now it's okay to to open up the floodgates a little bit. Meanwhile, Kawhi Leonard is still Kawhi Leonard. The only aberration he had in this game was he was 6 of 11 at the free throw line. I don't think he had missed more than one free throw in the entire series prior to that. So that's huge for, for them. 32 and 7, though, made it look effortless, especially at the start of the game. He was unconscious. Harold did a lot of his damage late for his 19 and 11. Um, he ends up leaving the game. I haven't heard the latest on him. He ends up leaving the game with a few minutes left uh, and rushing straight back to the locker room. I'm not sure what happened there. You also had a moment where, and maybe some people suggest that this is why Marcus Morris actually ends up targeting Luca and his ankle a couple times in the game. On a loose ball, Luca's trying to get a rebound, and his elbow hits Reggie Jackson in the head. Reggie Jackson leaves the game for a while before returning. And it looked incidental, but I don't doubt that there's frustration in there for Luca with how uh, how lopsided the officiating has seemed in one side of the court where the Clippers, if you make any contact, it seems like it's a foul. Just and one after and one after and one in this game. And then Luca could go the other way, get mauled three times in a row, and he might get one whistle. Like, Luca's done great getting to the foul line this series, but there is a real problem that over the last three games now, he's only shooting about 51% from the free throw line. That is crap. A major Achilles heel of Luca's has shown itself again at a very inopportune time. And the three point percentage, you know, he had that, that great flourish to finish out the game two games ago last night obviously not really a factor for him one of six from three and yeah it's uh it's rough going very rough going now i do like how the, the clippers you know they they made some good adjustments they finally threw their primary two defenders at luca they were they were smothering with seth curry and at times yeah you did see Kawhi even willing to take trey burke and that took Dallas's two biggest necessities as far as guys to really step up and at the very least minimized their impact. Then you had them able to hold Luka largely in check. Like I said, he had something like nine points at the half. And by then, the game's already out of control. The game's already like 24 or something at half. I mean, they're running away from Dallas. It's like 76 to 50 or something. So 26, if that's the case. Uh, at half and yeah Luca ends up with 22 8 and 4 but it's not great shooting it's like 6 of 15 from the field 1 of 6 from 3 and you see he's dealing with discomfort and you know when you have multiple plays with Morris going at that ankle and then having the audacity after the fact to take exception to it uh, and act like you're the one besmirching his good character or something to, again despite an entire history of his career and us knowing better 
then you know it is what it is. So that's how the series uh, might pivot because if they don't have KP coming back, then it's hard to see Dallas getting another one. It's a war of attrition with how this series has been allowed to play physically. If Kane Fitzgerald is your head official for the next game for Dallas, Dallas is 1-5 in five with him officiating this season. And in every game he's officiated in this series, there have been shenanigans, whether it's the KP ejection, whether it's letting this game get out of hand and all of that, the, the inconsistency of officiating. It's something to call out. It's something to take note of for sure. Now, for what it's worth, I think the NBA probably should suspend Marcus Morris for game six. Even if you don't want to look at just the one play, which is the thumbnail here, well, it should be the thumbnail to this video. Of course, if I'm doing its own segment, perhaps that one gets the thumbnail for it. Regardless, whether it's that overhead shot, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, whether it's that play or it's later on when he clearly tries to Zaza Pachulia Luka on a three-point attempt. The same kind of play that ended Kawhi's career basically in San Antonio is exactly what Morris did here. Nothing. No call. Nothing. Something has to be done about it. You can't you can't do this. I mean, you're risking a face of the NBA, a face of the league's career and future by giving that kind of garbage, garbage play. There's no place in the game for that kind of crap. To intentionally attempt to injure your opponents, there's no, there's no justification. And if you're saying he didn't try to do that while pretending that it's just a super huge co like coincidence that not once but twice in a very short window of time, he went at an injured ankle of a superstar on the other team, then you're just lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself if you're just saying that you don't see that because everything, everything is there to see. But Dallas is going to have to figure out some things. They're going to have to answer who is going to be the guy that steps up. Now, he did get some threes out of Maxi. He went two of four in this game. So, hey, that's something, you know, what did it cost you? I think it was uh, today on Mavs Facebook had a, a good tweet about that. You know, the whole Thanos thing, like with the soul stone, like, you know, did Maxi make his three? Yes. What did it cost? Everything. Basically what happened here. Unless he can carry that over, you finally get Maxi knocking down a couple threes. And uh, it comes in a blowout loss, unfortunately. Meanwhile, DeLon Wright came in and he made a little bit of impact, but still just feels very out of control. I don't know that he fits long term with what they want to do. And if you want to talk about guys that you want to move around to maybe make room for Trey Burke, I think DeLon Wright's a very good candidate for that. But uh, yeah, this is a rough one, guys. The final of this, which I notice I don't have the final posted there, but the final of this game was a whopping 154 to 111 in favor of the Clippers. I think it's the second biggest loss in playoff history for the Mavericks as a franchise. Let me see. I can check some notes on this here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, you know what? It ties the biggest loss in franchise history. The other one being game one of the uh, playoffs against the Lakers in 1984. That was a 134-91 defeat. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. But... Anyway, that's going to do it for this video. Hang tight. We'll, uh, we'll try to ride this out and get back into the series, or we'll do one more of these videos for the playoff edition. And you know what? You, you want to get one more if you can, but at the same time, if you don't, hold your heads high. Future's bright. This franchise, this team, showed a lot of heart and character and exceeded so many expectations this whole season, but particularly in this playoff series. So... Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect.